So, I think it's time to get started. Please feel very welcome to this presentation called DDD Really Matters. I am uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Nilsson from Sweden, and I will do my best to speak English today. I will actually also speak some German and some uh, Swedish. Let's see if, if that's understandable. So I've been in the business of software development for 30 years now. Uh, actually, I, start, uh, I stopped counting. I guess it's a few more. And uh, I have a, an idea of staying here for a while more. So how many of you are um, developers in here? Lots of hands. Architects. Quite many testers, project managers, uh, CIOs, CTOs. Okay, great. And some of you are hybrids, I guess. It's always hard to answer those questions. Am I a developer or an architect? I guess lots of you are both. So now I know how I'm, who I'm going to offend here, and I can be really nasty to the CTOs and CIOs. So. Let's try that. Actually, I think I have most uh, to say about developers, as a matter of fact. So earlier, I used to be an agileist, um, a ddd -er, and uh, I've been that for a long time. I think I'm more like that nowadays, actually. It's just growing on me after all those years. So I, I will uh, continue in, on that path for more years, I think, because I love to learn new stuff. Okay. With that out of the, uh, uh, with that done, let's start with the presentation. So the idea of this presentation is is to uh, try to come up with a couple of proposals that I've collected during my career for how to really elevate the business of your clients. For you as a developers, helping your clients to really become successful. I'm sure you have lots of ideas in this area as well. So. Let's talk about that afterwards with a beer. Is it beer or bear? I always have a trouble with that. Let's have one of those, the, the one we drink. Okay, so we'll uh, start with a couple of observations here and see if you recognize any of those. The first observation is uh, me going to a workshop with really hardcore security people, military grade security people. They, they invited me to the workshop because they wanted to hear a little bit about how developers think about initiating a new project. So you in the DDD field, how do you do, they asked me. And I told them a couple of ideas of how we typically get started. I didn't, uh, I wasn't able to tell them a lot before they were totally shocked. They were amazed of how reckless I was, they said. How, how can you be so, not thinking about security at the first uh, page. For example, uh, you, of course you have to start with a security assessment of the information that is being used in the system. And I was a bit surprised actually because, well, uh, how can I start there? I, that, that's in my world a bit wrong. It's a little bit too early. It's a bit about starting with talking about how thick shall the door be. And who mentioned a house at all? Maybe it was a bike. I, I couldn't really see it as they did. I, I still don't, actually. The second example, this is the CIO. He's out uh, in, at the town going to stores for buying stuff. Because here is another initiative just about to be started. And he has decided we definitely need a workflow package. He hasn't talked to the business yet at all, so we don't know what is supposed to be done, but everybody needs that. Or it could just as well be a really large package for being agile, a product for making it possible to be agile. That's in the same area. Third example, this time also the same theme, something new is about to get started. I take a walk over to the operations department to uh, yeah, just have a cup of coffee with them and chit chat a little bit. And I mentioned that, well, uh, have you heard about the project that might start up in a couple of weeks? She gets pissed on me. Why on earth am I the last one to hear about this, she says. We have to order servers, we need to decide protocols, SLAs, and so on and so forth. 
And I said, whoa, uh, I, I can't answer any of those questions yet. Nothing has been decided. I'd, I have no clue what, what the direction will be here. Uh, but she kind of calms down when I promised that she will be the first to know about everything. Nothing else will start before that. And the fourth example, again, a very experienced person. This is a project manager coming in to a client of mine. Again, for helping out with an upcoming initiative. The project manager spends a couple of months creating a very large tree of documents. It looks quite professional, I have to admit. But uh, a bit later, I have a look at that document tree, and I find it's each document only have headers. They are only templates. Something should go in there someday when something is decided. Again, a bit strange, I think. Have you seen any of those? Or does it sound that I'm just making it up from my weird world? A few nods. I'm sure you can find more on the same theme here. The message here isn't that they are unprofessional or evil or anything like that. Not at all. They are uh, really skilled people. And this didn't work out. This wasn't the way I wanted it to, to happen. This was, what I, what I would say, wrong in different ways. And I think what happened here was that if you focus on a speciality and you do that in vacuum, it's typically not going to turn out well. It's very much about doing activities at high speed, very professionally, but you're not getting anywhere, going anywhere. So doing activities instead of creating outcome or doing business instead of business. So, so I think we have a mindset problem here and a gap. So the question is how can we create an environment and a discussion climate for really working together to really collaborate? Because working together with all those skilled people, I really want to do that. Because in, the, in that gap between us all, there is something, there is a lot of potential, a lot of interesting stuff going on. So I'd like to achieve something else than, than I painted here before. If you feel that I'm uh, creating a depressing uh, feeling here now, I can assure you that the presentation will have a Hollywood ending. So it, it will all end well. So, that was problems, and developers hate problems. We want to focus on solutions, isn't that right? So let's uh, move over to the proposals. I have five of those. The first question is what to start with, and I think this is actually the absolutely most important proposal. This movie, have you seen it? Anyone? One? Yeah. So w which one is it? Holy Grail. I think someone said, yeah. Holy Grail by Monty Python. Quite an old movie. Still can't look at it without a little smile on my face. It's something about Monty Python. Uh, so this story is from um, an interview with John Cleese many years ago when he told about how this uh, movie was created. And part of the interview, he tells a passage about uh, a certain scene that didn't work out. They shot it once, they shot it twice, a third time. It wasn't really funny. It, uh, it, was, uh, it kind of uh, let the mood drop a few levels. So they took a break, went to a table, sat around the table, all of the, all of the team, and came up with a new idea. And they thought, this new idea might work. Let's try it out. And so they shot that new idea. And it was really fun. They really, ah, oh, this was a good time to end the, the, the day, they said. So they went home and, and uh, took off. A couple of days later, or weeks later, they are looking at the finished movie before it's going to production. And uh, it's, of course, it's very fun, uh, all the parts, and they, they are having a really good time. But then they come to this scene, this troublesome scene, and it's still not good. It still doesn't feel right to them. So John realized this is actually not the version we wanted. So they asked the editor, what happened here? 
And the editor said, yeah, you are totally right. I, I, we couldn't use, use this, the version you wanted uh, because it was spoiled. <coughs> oh, that's, that's bad. So they asked the editor if they can have a look at the scene anyway, even if it's spoiled. And he shows it to them and they find it to be hilarious. They cry out of joy. And then they ask him, what was wrong here? And he's, he's a bit tense now. He's quite irritated with them because the spoiled scene, obviously it lacks a couple of pixels here, a few seconds. Probably someone had a knee in front of the camera, spoiled. And yeah, you can guess what, uh, which scene made it into the finished movie, of course. Because it's quite important for a comedy to be funny. So probably, again, this editor, he was really professional. He wanted to take care of his reputation. He knew that the whole world of editors would laugh at that scene, looking at it in slow motion. <laughs> what, a, what a crappy editor. Doesn't really matter. That's not the, the thing about a comedy movie, for it to be technically perfect. So the answer to the question, what to start with? Actually, I have another uh, variant of telling the same thing here. Shall I pick the boat, the airplane, or the car? It's impossible to answer that question without knowing what, what's the purpose of the question. So is it going to the neighbor for a glass of wine? Probably I shouldn't have any of those. Or is it going to Mars? Won't fit either. So what to start with, I think, is to start with purpose. That's something we, we need to begin with. So we are starting slowly now to bridging this gap. We have something that might work out for us because we are now both the, the, the operations guys, for example, they know the purpose of this company now. So, ah, good. We are have, starting to have a little bit better possibility of a conversation now than we had before. But uh, this uh, bridge, well, we need to com continue working on it. A long time ago, when I was young, I had to uh, make a, an important decision in my life. In Sweden, it was mandatory to do military services. So I had to choose between doing military services or go to jail. And I was thinking about that for a long time. And then I decided to do it, and it was worse than I had actually uh, expected it to be. Uh, all of a sudden, I was away from my really nice development work, and. I had people screaming at me all the time, spitting in my face. Uh, it, it was just horrible. Anyway, five years ago, I started reading up on military theory. And it was like a shock to me to find out that 150 years ago, they knew how to do microservices right. Isn't that amazing? And one of the key things for doing it, for having Warfare, warfare in a dynamic setting where everything could happen, kind of like in a business, in, in the co uh, company. One of the key things, or the first thing, is to align on purpose. Without aligning on purpose for all those microservices or uh, uh, war teams, you can't have autonomy. Everything will be just wacko the moment something changes. And in war, everything changes all the time. So when they come to a situation, I, I, we are supposed to take this house, there is no house, hmm. then purpose will help them to do the right thing instead. So I have actually forgiven my old officers. All they wanted was to train me to become a really good microservice. Isn't that a nice uh, thought? Yeah. So if you find this, maybe some of you th think, well, this is obvious. But when you go back home to your company, I would, I would guess that quite a lot of your colleagues haven't thought a lot about this. And even worse, 
I quite often find it that the top management in companies uh, all around uh, haven't thought a lot about it either. So maybe you can get your colleague on, on track and they want to, well, this sounds nice, uh, but what is our purpose? <laughs> and that might not be so easy to find. Other people back home at the office might say, purpose is just crap. Everything that counts is making money. I hear that quite often, actually. That mumbo-jumbo of uh, fluffy purpose, who cares? I don't think going strongly for uh, a purpose has anything to do with not making money. Actually, on the contrary. When people in the company really believe in the purpose, they jump out of bed because today I'm one, one more day in my help here for curing cancer. That's actually a quite a better way of motivating people than just giving them some wage, I would say. So on top of the wage, this is much stronger, much better. All of a sudden, companies with a strong purpose, they make more money, I would say. It's not skipping that part. So with purpose decided, as something really important. Let's take the next one. So we are going to uh, continue building on this bridge. Now I'm uh, adding some pillars here for, yeah, um, adding stuff to it to make it stronger. So the context, this was also totally forgotten, I think, in those four observations at the start. We are working in a certain context. We are in a certain setting all the time. For uh, people who are doing domain-driven design, how many of you are into domain-driven design? Quite, um, quite many. 15 years ago when I asked that question, I never found a single uh, arm. So, except once I found one arm, and then it was, the, was Eric. So uh, didn't mean that much. It has changed a lot. Anyway, so uh, if you're into domain-driven design, this is also a very simple question. What's the context? Of course, the business is the context, or the domain. What else? That's so obvious. That wasn't uh, something that was touched on on those four initial stories at all. So domain-driven design could just as well have been named, I think, business-driven design, because that's what it is. We should let the business drive our design. We will come back to domain-driven design over a couple of times over the presentation. So this is actually me, but it's not a, a beer in my hand. This is actually a sound blocker. Uh, so uh, we, when you're going out on an adventure, you're planning it, it's going to be super fun. There is always someone saying, don't forget the sound blocker. And that's absolutely necessary, but just focusing on that won't take you very far. It's more like, yeah, yeah. Of course, we should do that. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And this is very much what I find when it comes to business development in these different companies as well. They are thinking way more about the defensive aspects of business development than the offensive. It's like playing soccer in this way, all, all the whole team in the goal. And uh, well, yeah, that's probably the correct action in a certain point in time, but it's rarely a good way of winning in the game. So uh, I'm not either saying that you should only go for attack, of course not. You, you need to have a balance between the two of them. But uh, I th once again, I think quite often that the business development it has a tendency of being focused on the defensive side such as we're not going to do anything until we have fulfilled all the compliance requirements. Have you heard that? So in three years, we can start thinking about taking new markets and things like that. The offensive, on the other hand, is growing markets, going into new markets as examples. The first one is much more into cost cutting, and the second one is about increasing revenue. Maybe that's why I think the second one is much more fun. That's what I'm automatically going for. It's not unheard of. Companies that are doing cost cutting, they are actually causing damage to their revenue. Have you seen that? That happens quite often. You, but it's kind of put under the carpet a little bit. 
It's not without danger. Another thing about this, um, what, what to focus on here, is that you can't possibly make the cost lower than zero. That would be hard. But the, uh, to increase the revenue, it's limitless. And if you can increase the revenue a lot, you don't have to think too, uh, a lot about the cost at all, I would say. So to me, it makes a lot of sense to focus on increasing revenue, definitely. It's all, uh, maybe the first one is a little bit about uh, being driven by fear, and the second one is about being driven by inspiration or want to improve and things like that. The next take on this organizational stuff, you can, if you really want outcome instead of just activities, you can also uh, organize for that, of course. In this first organization here, I'm trying to show quite a classic organi organization of specialized departments collaborating for creating an outcome. So maybe it's the marketing department at first, they do stuff, think about what shall be done, then they toss that result over to the next department, which might be the construction department. They do stuff, toss it over to the developers, toss it to the testers, and finally, the client will receive it. it yeah, it, we have been doing it a lot like that in the past. All those arrows here, they mean friction and delays, and uh, well, every department thinks the other department is like crazy and they dislike each other and uh, it just comes from this organization. It's only natural or it happens all the time. A variation here might be to organize like this instead. More like a product focused organization. I think this is uh, commonly named as. So now instead of having specializations in different departments, we create a new department picking people from different specializations and put them together. All the, the friction and the delays are gone in this organization. Everybody are very close to the client. In the prior, the, in the first version, the marketing team was very far away from feedback from the client. So typically this works out much better, I would say. I'm sure there are situations when it's wrong, but more, more or less, uh, most often I find that to be the best one. And it works out until maybe the CFO sees that you are actually doing similar stuff at two places. Are you, are you crazy, he would say, or she would say. Are you having HR at two places? We can't have it like that. That's costly. Let's go for uh, having specialized HR. And then it continues, and then we are all back to the, the first var variant again. <coughs> Strangely enough, I've been trying it out a couple of times on that kind of people who, who think a lot about cost and duplication, and not too much about efficiency and uh, revenue, and ask them, how would you deal with the crisis situation? Strangely enough, they would definitely go for the second one, immediately. They, that's how we do the, We, Everybody we need for solve the problem, we put them in a room, lock the door, and tell them they can come out, out when they are done. That's the second one. So they kind of have it in them. I, I'm not sure why. They try to fight it, uh, if it, even when it actually works out really well. I would say that developers have a tendency of disliking the idea of the second one, at first at least. Uh, it could be like uh, the developer saying, me hanging out with the sales guy? <laughs> that, that's the worst I've ever heard of. But ironically, I think developers hanging out with sales guys and other specializations, they are actually becoming better developers. It's not just about creating better outcome, it's good for them as well. And of course you can, can go over to your uh, other colleagues in the other team from time to time, but your first priority is, is the outcome from your team. That's just uh, the idea. Another gap. Uh, 
between managers and developers. It's quite commonly a, a situation of not understanding each other too well. But I have a, a super simple model that I'm using quite often here that I think works quite well. It's like all other models that they are all wrong, but some are useful, and I think this is useful. But you will be able to tear it down in a few seconds, I'm sure. The idea is like this. The, the managers typically think more about money than the developers. Developers typically think more about the code than, than managers. But you could actually kind of connect those two because code is kind of like money. And for example, we are creating code for creating value. Value is measured in money. Or I think it's more costly to maintain a, a very large code base compared to a smaller one. Would you agree? Two million lines of code is typically more costly than 10,000. So you could tell the manager that, well, one single line of code would cost you like one pound a year in maintenance. And I, again, I know all of you are now thinking, I'm going to write very long lines. And well, you can tear it down, but it kind of helps you if you want it to. Because all of a sudden, the manager would now start thinking here, oh, why didn't they tell me before? Now I understand why the developers are whining all the time about crappy code and not having time to make it right and things like that. Oh, maybe we shouldn't add that stuff on speculation because that in 10 times in 10 years, that will cost us millions to maintain, and I'm not sure about it. And uh, all of a sudden, they start thinking in the right direction. Actually, they, the managers, they will be so fond of you because now they understand that all you are thinking about is their money, and they start crying because they love you now. Strangely, um, maybe this is not so useful for your US developers. But think about it. Would you like to be able to discuss with the manager? Then you can use it. I realize this is not a developer-centric model. It's a collaboration-centric model. So why, why is this model helping us? I think it kind of makes us go in the right direction, not just as developers, but the whole, the whole company. Because I think size, when it comes to code base, is tremendously important. So trying to make it, the code base small is a good thing. Because when the, the size of a code base grows, then you will automatically uh, increase the cost as well. You will see uh, more bugs. The delays will be harder and bigger. And what is the reaction now? We have a code base growing rapidly. What will someone say now? Maybe the project manager. We have to rewrite. rewrite. That with the architect say, not the project manager. For Christ's sake, no, 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 <laughs> no, no. I think the project, anyone might say, we are too few here. We need to add people. And now the scary stuff starts. Adding people will most probably lead to exactly. We get more code, and this is a very vicious circle going rapidly down. And we are out of control here, I would say. There was a book written 40 years ago called The Mythical Man Month. And uh, there is a formula in the book that quite uh, interesting, actually. If you, have, if you are on a delayed project, with that formula, you can calculate how much more delayed you will be if you add one person. So if you, if you don't want to ever finish, just add a lot of people, and that will do the job for you. This code base wasn't written by two developers, <laughs> or three. It wasn't 2,000 either, but uh, quite many. And I think this picture becomes really scary when you realize it's actually not a dependency diagram for classes. It's a dependency diagram for assemblies. Isn't that what keeps you awake at night? <laughs> yeah, really scary stuff. It's not around any longer, but 
That, that's typically not happening when you are only two developers in a team. You don't have time to write a lot of code like that. How could you possibly do that? You had to find other solutions, more, smaller solutions for getting the job done. So, start with purpose. Remember to think about the context being the uh, business and that the, it's all about creating outcome. That was the two first proposals. The third one, how to work. So again, we are doing more on the bridge here now. This is a preparation for the ne next step that will take us very far with creating a really strong bridge. It's still very weak. I might be able to walk over it every now and then, but uh, I'm not going to do it often. I'm a little bit heavy also nowadays, so that's part of the problem, I guess. But uh, no, we, we need more here. So the, the third idea is to focus on language. Again, something that is very, very strongly uh, proposed in the domain-driven design book, the ubiquitous language. So some of you might have said from time to time, as a developer, I'd love to speak to the domain experts because that's what the book tell, tell, talks a lot about. But the domain expert doesn't have time for me. Have you ever had that feeling? They don't have time for me? I think it could be two reasons, maybe a few more, but the two most typical, I would say, is either the domain expert don't care about what you're doing, and then there is typically only one solution to that, and that's to leave. You can't possibly succeed with the domain expert who don't care. It's obviously not important. So leave that project as soon as possible. The second reason is that they might find you a little bit boring. <laughs> I know this is offensive uh, to be offending you here, but maybe you have seen it. You go into the domain expert's office and you kind of take a step into his room and then you start talking about repositories and side effect free functions and yada yada. It takes one word of those. And then the domain expert gets a blank face like this. And then he remember a very important meeting very quickly. That's not good. So another story from my life. I was going to Austria, Kitzbühel, for skiing with my my wife and my youngest son, we were standing in a ski, ski lift queue, waiting for our turn. All of a sudden, there is a very small boy skiing over to us, standing next to my wife. So we have lined up like this. It was a four-seater lift, and we are three. And now he stands next to, to my wife. And we, that's a little bit strange, my wife thinks, because she hears the ski teacher screaming something like, Achtung, achtung, bleib in der Gruppe, which kind of means come over to the group, stay in the group. And my wife thinks this is oh, not too nice. Uh, maybe they think we will kidnap him or something. So she starts doing like this and kicks him. And, and he is uh, screaming back to his ski teacher that uh, I don't actually know what because I don't know German. So, but something. Probably he said, uh, I, I, leave me alone. <laughs> and uh, then he turns over to us and says, Jag vill åka med er. And that's Swedish, meaning I want to go with you. So what obviously had happened here was that he heard us speak in the Q area. He, he heard Swedish and he wanted, really wanted to speak to us. He actually liked us just because we shared that language. And in the, in the ski lift going up to the top, he talked, uh, actually I couldn't say anything because he talked all the time um, in Swedish and he had a really good time. And uh, yeah, we didn't kidnap him, but we could. We could easily kidnap that boy. <laughs> he wouldn't even have noticed, actually. So he, it turned out he lived in Sweden every summer and yada, yada. So, yeah, very nice. But I thought that was actually, it's almost too powerful to share a language. So taking that story back to the problem of the domain experts, 
when we realized that they don't find it too interesting to talk about the developer uh, stuff, we, we can actually do kind of the opposite and use this trouble to become a superpower of us. We start trying to speak their language as much as we possibly can. Something very dramatic will change now. They, they will lock the door. They won't let you go because you are such a nice guy to talk to. You, they will love you. And when you go to the pub in the evening, you will notice the domain expert is following you. That's a little bit scary at first, but they, they want to hang out with you. You are interesting and you are starting to together, not just listening to them and uh, uh, collecting the ubiquitous language. It's very much about creating the, the ubiquitous language together because they are not uh, having the perfect crisp language that the compiler will understand. They are saying the same word for different things and, and different words for the same thing. And, and they need your, your uh, skill of detecting those problems. It go, goes the other way around as well. When you talk about their business problem in their language and how you have solved it in code, they will detect a bug like that. That's not how it works, they would say to you. They, they are incredible at doing that. Because now you have really quality communication going on and that's really something to, to long for. When I say a domain expert, I don't uh, mean someone who can do the job. That, that's not the, the thing. The, the domain expert, it's not either about knowing the old system. Typically, those kinds of people are named the domain expert. I think a domain expert is something else. A domain expert, of course, he or she can do the job, but they are kind of like the best in the world in their field. And they can not only do the job, they can actually, on a meta level, build a machine to do the job. They are thinking in that way. And now you realize that there are not that many domain experts around, and that actually only makes it even more important to take care of them, because you really want to hang out with them as much as possible. And all of a sudden, your work will be much more fun, the results will be much more better, and every now and then there is a breakthrough that is just amazing to experience, how everything just becomes better. So, oops, fortunately not red wine at least. Okay, so we are using the best building material in the world. Software, software is magic because when we have built something, created something with, in software, we can just um, check if it's doing what we want it to. If it's not, we just press Control Z and we are back, back to the previous stage. Or backspace for taking it out. And it's super soft to make changes to it. So this building material, it would make the carpenter go nuts if he had something similar. It's way, way better. Strangely enough, this is not how it's working in practice, I would say. Because this curve here shows what is kind of like law of nature to most people in the world regarding software. When they would like to make a change to a piece of software, that cost, the cost of that change increase over time and it's increasing rapidly, very rapidly. It's quite fast that you need that rewrite that was mentioned here. What, I can't do any changes any longer. It costs a million to make anything. So, yeah, there is no uh, escape, maybe, in a couple of situations. That's kind of strange that software is becoming like that when it's, it's such a, a beautiful material to use. And this is not what we want, of course. We prefer this curve instead. It's, it is a little bit more expensive to make a change later on in the life cycle of a system, but the, the increase in cost is not going banana. It's kind of flat after a while. So what are you uh, using for getting that second curve? What is your favorite tool? 
How do you achieve it? This is one of those questions you can say anything and I will say it's correct because there are so many things. DDD, someone said, yes, that's correct. TDD, the best developers, domain experts, all of those things. You can't just pick one, you have to pick a lot of things. And it's uh, hard work every day, but it's possible to achieve. And this is actually super important for the company you are working for, because if you have that second curve, all of a sudden the business people have the possibility of making several tries or several attempts with their IDs. With the first curve, they had one ID. Typically, the first ID doesn't work out as, as you want to. And the, the second ID is impossible because it became too expensive. On the other hand, with the second curve, that's a really, really beneficial situation to be in for a, a company that needs to be, do, be doing business development all, all the time. So this is not just us being, want to create good stuff for our own sake. This is actually helping the company a lot, very valuable. On the same page here of uh, focusing on language, there was a paper written 25 years ago called Language Oriented Programming. And the idea is that not just use the general purpose language for solving all problems. Some, for some parts in a system, it might be very beneficial to create a new language together with the business expert that is actually his or her language. This is how I would express myself. And from that point in time, they can actually take care of that part of the application on their own, or at least that quality discussion I talked about before, when we talk to each other in a very good way, now we are actually programming together. It's not forbidden for a business person to program with you. I think that's super cool when that happens and when that's possible and very, very beneficial. But we are quite fast of talking with the domain expert and then say, please leave, I have to open Visual Studio now. I think that's the common, and I think that's wrong, actually. I think we can do a lot here. I've been doing this for quite many years now, and it's unfortunately a bit more tricky than uh, you, you might first think, but I still believe this is the next big thing. So in 10 years, I will come back here and tell you it was, I was right. Is that okay? H have you tried it? No? That's actually lovely. Okay, some, some has, yeah. Uh, but the rest of you, here you have something really fun to dig into. This is both fun as a technical uh, challenge, as it is for a way of getting closer to your domain experts. It, it's both parts of it. It's a long, different story, but you can Google it. And uh, ping me if you want to talk more about that. Okay, we have done three things now. Time for proposal four. Now we are using uh, what we've done to the bridge before and we kind of uh, uh, make it really strong now. So after this proposal, it should work out for bridging the gap and we should be able to collaborate. So this fourth idea proposal is to use the circle of safety. You might have noticed it, especially this is the case in large organizations and old organizations, that when a small group is starting a new initiative, all of a sudden the immune system of the, this corporation goes off and try to kill that new initiative. Have you seen that? It happens all the time. Because this big organization, it's not out of evilness either, it just happens, it's kind of like, it wants everything to stay the same. Please let us have status quo. No new ideas, they say. So if you are about to try out some new ideas, you need to put up very high fences around that. Most typically, you should actually not do it at the company at all. Do it in secret some, some, somewhere else. Because otherwise it won't work out for you. If you have that protection around that little team, 
it's not just the outside that might be the problem. Because all of you sitting in here, all your ancestors very far away back in time, they were quite afraid. They were very careful people. So when they ha heard a little noise, like a, some, some uh, uh, leave uh, making a sound, they immediately thought that that might be a lion, and they took off. And that was a, quite a good tactic back in the days, because uh, life was, uh, yeah, it was more dangerous than nowadays. Unfortunately, that was a good tactic back then. Nowadays, it's typically not, because our brain is kind of still the same. It evolves quite slowly. So when you are in a team, working together in a very good way, and you don't dis get disturbance from the outside, but uh, one, one day, one of your team members come, come in the morning, and he doesn't say hi then your um, brain tells you, danger, this is not good. And you think for a second, is, is he going to kill me? No, it's probably not. But the whole day you are thinking about this, all your energy is actually lost just because of that. Isn't that really, oh, uh, we have to think about how to behave. The next day, the same colleague behaves the same way. Now you're definitely sure he will kill you. And all of a sudden, there is no energy being used for creating outcome. All of the energy is thinking, oh, how, oh this is oh, not good. So we have to think very carefully about this also, how we are talking to our colleagues all the time. I have a little tip here that help, has helped me a couple of times, a communication style. So imagine a meeting, uh, maybe 10 people, and uh, then I tell someone, stop looking at the phone. And that creates not such a nice uh, atmosphere in that meeting. Not only that, nobody is listening any longer. After I said that, nobody will hear what I'm saying. Because they are thinking, what, what's wrong with Jimmy? He's, he's typically nice. He's behaving like an asshole. And is that because? And, and they start making stories. Again, all those stories, they are not very logical. They are always taken to the most possibly extremely negative they could possibly be. So all of them have kind of decided I'm deadly sick or something, or it must be very, very bad. But I could use this instead. I could have said the same thing in four dimensions. I could say, I observe, I think, I feel, I want. For example, something like, I can see that you are looking at your phone all the time. That makes me think that you might not want to be in my project. And that makes me feel very sad because I really want you in my project. Something like that. It, I hope it was a little bit less uh, threatening than the first version, I, I think so. And uh, this is slower. But uh, on the other hand, it saves hours and hours of energy loss. Quite often I forget about this, but you can always go back. If you have a troublesome situation, go back and try again. You can try again many times, and it's not getting a worse problem, and you might solve it. So. Something important, I think, in that uh, circle of safety is the possibility of failing forward. If you are not allowed to fail, well, that's a troublesome situation. I went to a big car producer in Sweden many years ago for discussing a, a new project, and I was very proud when I got there. And I told them that I probably have the world record in mistakes, I said. And I thought that was, now they will love me. They hated me. They wanted to kick me out. They never did any mistakes. That was the worst I've ever heard. Uh, and I thought that this is quite strange. How, how can you not do mistakes? How can you learn? And have you really tried? There's a museum called the Mu Museum of Failure. A friend of mine is running that. And uh, it's uh, ironically a big success, this thing. 
It uh, tours the world. I think it's been in London. Have you anyone seen it? Anyway, it, it uh, kind of put uh, mistakes in the highlights, such as fat-free Pringle. I think that's my favorite. Isn't that a lovely idea? It probably sounded really good at first, but it was a failure. But who cares now? And who remembers it? It seems like failures, they come and go. It's not something we are thinking too long ago, uh, long about. I think we could take inspiration from this, actually, and have a museum of failure at each of our offices. And it's not a bad thing to have your ideas there. It's actually like, oh, he's that guy. He's really pushing the limits and trying things out. Because, as I said before, it typically is not taking one try for creating a success. Might, if you only have one chance, you also have this problem of analysis paralysis because you know you only have one try, it, you will think for years before you try. But if you skip that, it's totally fine to try 10 times, 100 times, and sooner or later you will have your success, I'm very sure. Ten years ago, I wrote an article, and I think this was the worst name of an idea I've ever had, Shunk Cloud Computing. Eric Evans actually asked me not to use it, and I should have listened. Anyway, what I tried to uh, describe was that for uh, creating a nice organizational setting or, and a nice architecture, for protecting the different teams and the different subsystems, you need to have borders. So this is kind of like taking the bounded context ID and pushing it a little bit further. But to me, this was, yeah, it's, first of all, it's very much about circle of safety. And uh, when I wrote the paper, I was super tired of trying to force everybody to develop in the same style. For example, I think that I can't live without TDD, but uh, most people, are very uh, pro productive without it. So why should I force them? They can be in another team, work the way they want, and create the value they, they can. And, and I'm not going to nag on them, because I'm in another team with people that think the same way. That was one of the reasons for this paper. Um, it was uh, quoted in the microservices definition article by James Lewis and Martin Fowler. So this is actually the reason for microservices. I know that a lot of people think that microservices is for tiny, tiny technical stuff. And technic is, uh, operations is the driver. That's wrong, actually. Sorry. It's not about tech, it's about organization. I'm joking a little bit. You can choose whatever you want to believe, of course. So finally, proposal five. Now we have this uh, bridge, and we are traveling it. It's not just us going over to the managers and the operations and the product manager. They will come to us, and we run there all the time, as much as we need. And we have this new possibility. Now what? What, what shall we use it for? We, I think we should use it this way. I think we should, shall think about what are the global bottleneck right now, which is the global bottleneck right now, and we try to solve that. That's the, uh, the basic idea here. And we are not typically thinking too much about everything. We are forcing or focusing on our core domain because this is the place where we have our competitive edge it feels much uh, more reasonable to invest money here than in uh, wh whatever is more of a generic domain of your company. For example, you might have an HR de department. It's important, but it's not different from any other HR departments in the world. Maybe they don't have, need to have custom software. You should have that instead where you are really creating the value for your clients or uh, for the, your customers. But first, before we have a little uh, look at uh, bottleneck solving, I'd like to say a few words about people and automation. I think this actually helps quite a lot. Uh, if you think about automation all the time, that takes away a lot of uh, fog for finding the real bottleneck. And I think we can do a lot more here than what we ha have done in the past, even in the development uh, area. Have you read the book Accelerate? 
two years ago, something like that. It's actually saying, it, it's based on uh, academic research, but they are saying something that is totally amazing, actually. And they say that we see a very strong correlation between continuous delivery companies and companies' uh, profit. So if you are doing com uh, continuous delivery, you probably make more money than the other companies. That's, uh, I think that's something that you can use for talking to your managers as well. So, automation, it's underutilized, and we should use it a lot. But I'm not saying that people should go away. I think people should still be used for uh, doing the in innovations and the creative stuff and relationships. People are much better at relationships still. This might change in the future, I don't know, but I haven't seen it yet. So. I prefer hanging out with another person than a computer, uh, socializing at least. But the rest, the repetitive stuff, for example, which developer is the fastest? Well, no developer will beat a program w when it comes to repetitive tasks, of course not. So, finally, bottleneck. I'm trying to show a bottleneck here. Something is put in from uh, the left. Um, and uh, probably there is some value being added, and finally there is output coming out. And uh, yeah, we're putting in two of something and only getting one out. For some reason, I think this is not something a developer typically would do, because you are so trained in optimization. You are doing that all the time in the code, and you have learned that it actually doesn't help to delete all the comments in the code everywhere, it's not running faster anyway. So you, you wouldn't do that. Business people think like this all the time. For some reason, they do like this. Let's invest and adding more stuff. And is this a good idea? Of course not. It's only stacking up more queue here now. And that, that wasn't just bad. It was actually costly. Or it didn't help, of course. And we didn't get more output outcome here. But we did spend more money. We actually create a mess in that uh, situation because stuff is piling up and that's costly in itself and it's creating trouble uh, for doing anything. All of a sudden you can't walk around uh, in that space, for example. Another idea might be to, well, let's uh, try to pull out more from the other side. It's the same, it doesn't help at all. Of course we should focus on, on uh, solving that bottleneck instead. But why is this uh, being, yeah, w w why the, those mistakes? I have a couple of ideas here. I think it's quite, I hear it quite often, well, let's, uh, let's do it anyway because it affects so many people. And I think that's a nice thought, but if you are affecting a lot of people in your organization, but not helping out with the bottleneck, you are not doing any difference at all. You could, could also see that, well, Google is doing it, let's, let's do it. And I think that's a really bad idea. Should probably think about situation, not just do what the others are doing. And Google, by the way, is not a perfect company. Have you, have you heard that? They have their own problems. And so, no, they are doing lots of great stuff, but might not be for us. And of course, the worst uh, problem, we have very loud, loud people and they want something and they get it. So. But uh, no, this is not uh, what we should do. We should try to solve the bottleneck because then we can spend very little money on solving that, but the effect is tremendous. So it's typically a situation of spending X and getting 10X in the result, and typically much, much more. What is, this is a, a bit, there are some traps here. For example, be very sure that you are the best friend with the CEO when you start doing this, that you have uh, the, the strong support from the top management, because when you are finding a global bottleneck, and you are taking that away, there will be a new bottleneck, typically not at the same place. It goes somewhere else. Those people will not be happy with you. 
they will hate you. They will do anything they can for moving it back again. And then you need the top management's help. I've tried them without. Yeah. Not a good idea. That's one thing. The other thing is, of course, it's very easy to get into the trap of local optimizations. We, we are running at full speed here, like what I just showed you. It doesn't matter. You have to think about the whole situation. So what really matters? Start with the purpose. The business is, con is the context. Focus on language. Use the circle of safety and solve the bottleneck and then repeat. With those five proposals, I think you will make a tremendous difference to the, to the company you are working for regarding their business uh, results. I promised the Hollywood ending, and now we have our four observations from the beginning smiling because they are still doing what they are really skilled at, but they are doing it together with the rest and with us. And we are just a happy crowd, really creating a difference. We are definitely making an impact in the situation now. It's totally different from the beginning. And I think most people are really feeling fulfilled when they feel that they are doing a, a good job. That's really important for us. So I have this dream. I, I have this dream that all the action that you are participating in is going on in a situation when what really matters is the norm and not the exception. And I think it's actually up to us to change that and make it so. So it's call for action and be our dream. I will do my best to be my dream at least. That's the ending of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening and please come and talk and about your proposals afterwards. Thank you.